Before we get started, hopefully you're listening to me and those on the outside. I don't know if I've created confusion about the last session of the year. It was supposed to be May 28th, I think, and uh, our sponsor can't do it that week, so the idea was to move it a week earlier. The first suggestion was we would just have the traditional morning session here, uh, Paul McBride the presenter, and then we'd have the social evening event that same evening. Paul and other people who drive in said, well, it's kind of a hassle to come into Seattle twice in a day. Can we make it on different days? So I've sent out two separate emails asking you to vote which you prefer, both sessions on the 21st, morning and evening, or one on the 21st here, which would be our last academic CME presentation, and then we'd have it the next evening over at, um, what's that place called, Palacris, the what used to be Patel Research over by where our old office was. So anyway, if you just give me a vote, uh, I'll pick which one the most people prefer, and we'll go with that system. Uh, hopefully I don't have to send out any more emails about that. Let's go ahead. We're a little bit late in getting started. Uh, I'm really very happy to have Jonathan Bernstein out here uh, to talk about immunologic disorders of the reproductive tract. I don't think we've really ever had this presentation before. And, I don't think there's anybody else in the country who's knowledgeable uh, about this and could give this presentation. It's something we occasionally, each of us, have a patient but really don't have any depth of knowledge. So this is really a very valuable presentation. Jonathan, thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, I, uh, let me see here. So we're... Um, Right here, I can go down this. Go like that way. Okay. All right, so I did, these are my uh, uh, conflict of interest. Uh, I am at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, we also have a, a clinical practice as well, uh, similar to uh, University of Washington. We have a, uh, a uh, training program, allergy training program. It's a, a NIH funded T32 uh, training grant. Uh, and so I think it's nice to be in the places where we are like-minded in terms of trying to uh, educate uh, well-qualified, uh, well-trained clinical, translational, and basic uh, allergist immunologists. Uh, these are the objectives of this talk, which we hope to do. Uh, I want to touch upon the immunopathogenesis of immunologic disorders, of both the male and female. Uh, and although there, uh, and there, there are obviously a lot of differences there, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, uh, but also there are some similarities. Uh, and we want to kind of go through a differential diagnosis of disorders that might affect both, both uh, female and male genital tracts, and then also understand current emerging therapeutic options for some of these uh, conditions. I'm going to start by uh, going over a case report and then touch upon the, both the innate and adaptive immune responses in the male and female, and then also uh, talk about a few clinical conditions and then conclude by uh, discussing the outcomes of the case report. So this is a 37-year-old female who had been married for eight years who presented with localized vaginal burning and pain after contact with seminal fluid, which began immediately after her first pregnancy. Symptoms progressed to bronchospasm with cough. She subsequently developed more severe systemic symptoms consisting of diffuse itching, wheezing, shortness of breath, butt flushing, facial swelling, and hives. And on three occasions, she experienced loss of consciousness with convulsions that occurred within 30 minutes after unprotected intercourse. After the third event, the association between these events and unprotected sexual intercourse was finally established by the couple. Uh, there was no history of drug allergies. Uh, the history, there was a history of food allergy to red and green peppers uh, in the, uh, for the female, uh, where she experienced nausea and vomiting uh, and, and headache, but uh, no other uh, symptoms. No, no history of sexually transmitted diseases. They had one child, as I mentioned. Uh, history of seasonal allergies and, and cat allergy. And she was told she had asthma, but never was physician diagnosed and never was treated. 
her husband uh, had uh, a history of food allergy to mushrooms, but was otherwise healthy. And his reaction was not really uh, what you would consider an Ig immediate response either. So with that uh, case in mind, we'll come back to that at the end of the discussion. I want to kind of uh, just talk about what, what we would be thinking about in, in, in this type of uh, presentation. Uh, and certainly on the top of the list would be something uh, you know, referred to as seminal plasma hypersensitivity, but there could also be seasonal allergic vulvovaginitis, recurrent allergic candida vulvovaginitis. It could transfer drugs or foods through body fluids. Uh, it could be an infection. It could be a contact dermatitis, it could be structural problems, it could be physically induced symptoms as well. So there is a, a, a number of things that one wants to think about when we uh, see patients with this presentation. So to understand the, immun, uh, the uh, immunology of the reproductive tracts, we do have to have a basic understanding of the anatomy. And uh, in terms of the female genital tract, it's divided as upper and lower genital tract. And the upper genital tract is sterile, and it includes the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the cervical plug. And the lower genital, tra genital tract is non sterile and includes uh, the ectocervix and vagina. And the male genital tract is protected anatomically by uh, long urethra, so it's uh, obviously much less susceptible to infection as a result. <clears throat> but most of what the, uh, you know, the immune system uh, is attempting to do is obviously protect the uh, female genital tract from a, a, an infection because obviously uh, the number one priority is, is conception and giving birth and you want to prevent these uh, organisms from uh, interfering with that process. Uh, so when, when you look at what type of um, components of the innate immune system uh, confer protection, uh, the, uh, these would include things like natural antimicrobial peptides, uh, pattern recognition, uh, toll-like receptors, defensins, complement, and effector natural killer cells. So what are these natural antimicrobial peptides? They're, they're whey acidic protein motif containing proteins, and they have two types. There's the secretory uh, uh, leukocyte protease inhibitors, SLPIs, and these include uh, neutrophil elastase, trypsin, and cathepsin G, and there's also a laughin, and these proteases are inhibited, uh, uh, that are inhibited include the uh, neutrophil elastase and proteinase 3. Um, they prevent host tissue damage by inhibiting these proteases released by bacteria. They reduce host susceptibility to microbial uh, colonization and infection, and they're found in highest concentration of cervical mucus and vagina where contamination is greatest, and levels fluctuate uh, during different uh, menstruation uh, <clears throat> periods. Uh, the defensins are small cationic proteins, and there's alpha and beta defensins, and the alphas are found in neutrophils and on epithelial surfaces, and the beta defensins are constitutively expressed or induced after challenge with, any, with an inflammatory infectious stimulus. And, and they have chemotactic, antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral properties important for host protection. And this just illustrates the distribution of these uh, natural antimicrobial peptides and defensins in the female genital tract. And you can see that throughout the sterile and non-sterile uh, parts of the uh, female genital tract, there's a good di distribution of these uh, protective um, uh, 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 proteases and defensins. Now, this just illustrates the um, have a pointer, the fluctuation, and again, depending on different parts of the menstrual cycle and so forth, you can see that uh, these uh, defensins uh, and these antimicrobial peptides uh, uh, do uh, peak at certain times throughout the uh, uh, menstrual cycle, uh, again, for various reasons to help protect <coughs> against uh, infection. Toll-like receptors, which we know quite a bit about, and a number of different processes, are also very important in the reproductive tract, and they're ubiquitously expressed. They're located on uterine natural killer cells. They respond to different ligands, leading to increased cytokine and chemokine production, or chemotaxis of monocytes and neutrophils into the surrounding tissue. And one can see here, um, <coughs> my eyes are, that you can see the distribution of these uh, toll-like receptors, some of them are extracellularly expressed, some are intracellularly expressed, uh, and they have a, m a number of different uh, uh, processes, and they are upregulated. Uh, you know, you see when you have, you have defensins and uh, the, these, these stimuli and so forth, these 
uh, from these different external, uh, whether it's a virus, bacteria, fungi, uh, they, they can become expressed. You get increased uh, expression of defenses and, and uh, natural antimicrobial peptides, and they can actually uh, have a lot of, uh, obviously, protect against many different uh, physiologic processes and immunologic processes. Other innate immune response players include complement activation, effector natural killer cells which promote immunologic tolerance during pregnancy. This is important for protecting the fetus from infection and possibly even mast cells, although it's unclear what the role is. So uh, a, a lot goes into obviously the innate immune response in the female genital tract to uh, protect against primarily infection. Now, in the male, uh, it, the innate immune responses are pronounced in the ejaculate. This is important to protect spermatozoa, and the seminal plasma is very rich in potassium, zinc, uh, a number of the other different uh, 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 citric acid, fructose, uh, uh, phosphorylcholine, spermine, uh, prostaglandins, PSA, a lot of enzymes, very rich in a variety of different enzymes. <clears throat> zinc is important. It's a prostate, prostate antibacterial factor and also binds several proteins, including uh, prostate-specific antigen, and when it's absent, sperm chromatin stability is uh, affected, leading to decreased fertility. You also can find uh, immunoglobulins and complement in the ejaculate as well. Now, the prostaglandins are very important because they have strong stimulatory and inhibitory effects on smooth muscle, and specifically, PGE2 can modify dendritic function, can affect differentiation, maturation, migration, increase production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, it increases expression of MHC class II molecules and TLR expression and activates NF-kappa beta signaling pathways. And PSA is also important. It's a serine calocrine inhibitor, and it's really important for clotting and lysing, lysis of clotted ejaculates. And as we know, it's a nice marker for prostate cancer, but it also activates PBMCs and resulting increased secretion of interferon uh, gamma by natural killer cells. And finally, seminal gelin is a substrate for PSA. It's although unknown function, the mechanism of, uh, uh, of action uh, is, uh, uh, but and it's not entirely clear. Uh, but improper degradation will lead to decreased sperm motility and decreased uh, fertility. Uh, it, the PSA does cleave a seminogelin, which leads to semen liquefaction, uh, liquef liquefaction and sperm motility. So a number of these things can go awry and can affect uh, uh, processes, uh, uh, <clears throat> normal operating processes. Now, in terms of the adaptive immune response, it's important to note that the female genital tract does not have an organized lymphoid tissue. It, it possesses antigen-presenting cells that express MHC class II molecules that are under hormonal control. Uh, the uh, endocervical uterine fallopian tube epithelial do elicit specific immune responses uh, that can increase cytokine chemokine responses, important for protecting from infection and protecting the ovum during implantation during pregnancy. Uh, and it's interesting that the, uh, these pathogens and hormones do influence the general microenvironment by favoring induction of immunity or promoting viral invasion. And an example <clears throat> of this is the HIV-1 virus, which uses the CCR5 chemokine <coughs> co-receptor to facilitate infection. So mm -hmm. it's been speculated that women taking oral contraceptives, which increase the CCR5 expression on CD4 cells, may be at increased risk for HIV viral transmission. There's also antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity of chlamydia-infected epithelial cells that may provide uh, you know, protection, anti-HIV protection in humans, specific CD8 uh, T cells in the cervix, again, mostly studied with HIV-infected women, uh, may function as specific cytotoxic T cells or producing interferon gamma that promotes antiviral activity. Uh, and again, women with pelvic inflammatory disease or recurrent chlamydial trachomatis infections have been demonstrated to have decreased gamma interferon production in response to heat shock protein 60, which is not seen in women with fewer infections. So again, these are other uh, responses. Uh, in the male reproductive tract, most of the T cells are CD8 suppressor cytotoxic cells, and they're located uh, with macrophages and epithelium and lamina propria of the vast deferons, epididymis, and the testes. And interferon gamma-producing activated T cells are potent inducers of MHC class II molecule expressions on antigen-presenting cells. Uh, we see uh, increased CD8 cells present along regions where the blood testes barrier is weakest, which may serve to suppress immune responses to uh, sperm-specific antigens. And in contrast, we see increased CD4 T cells present in the genital tract and semen of men uh, with these uh, spermatozoa autoantibodies. So there seems to be an important role there. 
What about spermatozoa autoantibodies? Well, they can result from a number of different things, trauma, infection, inflammation, uh, congenital abnormalities, secondary to vasectomies, and uh, these spermatozoa, they bound with autoantibodies auto are potent inducers of interferon gamma, and it's been shown that women who have husbands with these autoantibodies have higher levels of gamma interferon compared to women with husbands who don't have them. And of interest, uh, up to 50% of these T cells in male semen are the gamma delta type, and, and this T cell uh, subset is further increased in men uh, who have these autoantibodies or a uh, C. trachomatis infection, but it's still not clear what the significance of these uh, T cell subsets are uh, uh, in this situation. Does that lead to uh, infertility? Well, certainly it can. I mean, if, there's, if it's not treated, obviously, and, uh, and certainly uh, that's, the, that's the big issue is these impaired immune responses and with overwhelming infection. Um, the, uh, now, the heat shock proteins are very important uh, in the, in the, uh, the genital tracts. Uh, they're produced in response to microbial infection and inflammation. Uh, they're, you know, important. Any, any kind of inflammatory stimulus can cause the release of heat shock proteins from endothelial cells. Uh, they're important for down-regulating pro-inflammatory immune responses. Uh, they prevent intracellular protein degradation, incorrect polypeptide assembling. They inhibit macrophage production of IL-1, TNF-alpha, I mentioned HSP60 in women, but they also present in semen of men uh, with chlamydia infections uh, or uh, spermatozoa autoantibodies, but absent in semen uh, from men without these immune activating responses. And it's been shown that the gamma delta T cells can induce heat shock protein gene expression and synthesis of heat shock protein, which can then activate, uh, again, like another positive loop, can activate more T gamma delta cells. Uh, so it's uh, what I've what I've been very in my review of all of this. There's really uh, most of the research that's being done. Obviously, is interested in fertility, but there's still uh, a, a lack in terms of our understanding of the relative roles of these immune processes and other conditions, which I'm going to now turn to and talk about the clinical uh, conditions that involve the female and male genital tracts and. Some of these we may see, I know as allergist immunologists, we do see a lot of autoimmune conditions. Our division, just like I saw outside, you have rheumatology here, but ours is immunology, which is comprised of rheumatology and allergy. So there is some overlap and in some cases convergence. And I have, my, I have some cases of reactive arthritis um, the, and uh, <clears throat> Bichette's as well, uh, but uh, again, not very common cases. Uh, we'll also talk about ig mated diseases and, uh, and then some idiopathic conditions which are starting to emerge and you'll start to hear about. The autoimmune disorders are the, the uh, reactive arthritis, which used to be called Ryder syndrome. The American Rheumatology uh, 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 College of Rheumatology and uh, uh, the organizations have uh, gone through a renaming process of several conditions like Wagner's and Ryder's because these uh, conditions were named after notorious Nazis, so now they're calling them these different <laughs> names and so forth. But, um, so, so this is AKA writers. Uh, occurs after a genital urinary or GI tract infection. The triad is non gonococcal urethritis, conjunctivitis, arthritis. Uh, for this reason, we're not going. We might see them when they present with some conjunctival problems or and such, but we, we don't get to see these people that much. Um, uh, they do get what is mistaken as recurrent infections, and sometimes we see them because of immune def deficiency workups and things like that. When men are more common uh, than women, and they express HLA-B27, they get dysuria, urethral discharge, prostatitis, epididymitis, and in women they have uh, you know the dysuria, vaginal discharge, cervicitis, and vaginitis. And uh, chlamydia trochomatis is the most common cause of these. Uh, infections, but the immunopathogenesis overall is unclear. Uh, Bichette's, again, also unknown, and uh, the immunopathogenesis is somewhat unclear. Uh, recurrent episodic oral and genital ulcerations of the scrotum and penis in men and cervix and vulva region in women. Uveitis is very, uh, it can occur, and approximately 50% have large joint synovitis during acute attacks, and they have demonstrated these CD8T gamma delta cells showing up. Uh, in, this, in this condition, uh, and that uh, exposure to microbial antigens may be a contributing factor in, these, in certain individuals who express HLA B51. Uh, so, again, not much. It's a clinical, it's really more of a clinical uh, uh, diagnosis. Uh, there are some 
markers that are associated with these conditions. Now, what we see more commonly and, you know, is are women who have these recurrent uh, vaginal infections, and I expressed an interest with this because this was something that uh, Jim Metzger, who uh, you may recall, uh, he actually was very interested in this, and we were actually about to embark on a, a clinical trial to understand whether or not there was an, a localized <coughs> Ig hypersensitivity response before he got sick and passed away, unfortunately. So it never went beyond that. But um, but we see uh, patients, uh, obviously, quite frequently who have recurrent vaginal yeast infections. Are always worried that they have some kind of allergic process going on that's predisposing them to this. Uh, again, certainly we know that women with diabetes or oral contraceptives or taking recurrent antibiotics are more susceptible, uh, but most women have no recognizable risk factors. It has been shown that uh, abnormal macrophage responses to Canada results in increased PGE2, which can inhibit lymphocyte responses to Canada, and that uh, anti-Canada IG antibodies and PGE2 are increased in the vaginal fluid of women with recurrent vaginal candidiasis. Um, and. Um, Vaginal hypersensitivity to Canada may be caused by increased levels of PG2, which can suppress localized vaginal cell-mediated immune responses, resulting in yeast colonization and recurrent infection. So uh, this, again, uh, was the extent we understand about pathogenesis of this condition. Uh, however, uh, this condition uh, has been described, vulvovaginal Canada hypersensitivity, women presenting with recurrent vaginal Canada, <clears throat> Canada infections, culture proven, no identifiable cause, not responsive to topical or systemic antifungal therapy, <clears throat> and you can demonstrate specific Ig antibody responses to Canada albicans or uh, other cross-reacting uh, yeast uh, like Toleropsis glabrata or something of that nature. And this was Metzger's uh, study who treated 18 women, an open-label study, not blinded with recurrent vaginal uh, candidiasis with subcutaneous immunotherapy, and they found that 79 percent experienced a decrease in the mean number of vaginitis episodes after one year of treatment, which was quite uh, statistically significant. And this has been confirmed by other case reports and case series, but as yet we've not done a controlled study. Yes? Are these women, do they have candle infections other places? No, they really don't. These are just localized, recurrent, and they, they may respond to antifungals, but it comes right back. It's not necessarily related to intercourse or any other kinds of things and they they tend to be colonized and you can culture okay and otherwise they're immunologically immunologically are intact they're not immunodeficient and again these really aren't common types of infections we see anyway with uh, immunodeficiency um, and the specific IgD is in the serum I presume you can measure it in the serum and you can also measure it in, 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 in they have measured it in uh, localized vaginal lavage fluid as well but we measure it in Serum, you can skin test them as well, uh, and they will elicit responses. That being said, it's it's not always uh, at the kind of cutoff of one to a thousand, which we usually do with intracutaneous testing. Sometimes they require a little higher concentration, but uh, it's you know, but it is uh, it's an interesting phenomenon, and we've actually had some experience treating some of these women, and it's amazing the response. They're the most grateful people you'll ever want to meet once they've actually, and you don't have to push them up to high, in con contrast to conventional immunotherapy, you don't have to dose them with high concentrations. You can really uh, get up to uh, a one to a thousand or a one to a hundred dilution and they'll get benefit. And the length of treatment, you know, it's, it's not entirely clear. We follow similar uh, guidelines with immuno conventional immunotherapy in these women. And they do quite well. They are, they, they require, they, they don't get infections anymore. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, response. So uh, more needs to be done in this area. It's an open area for further investigation. Uh, <clears throat> I want to turn. Do and gynecologists recognize that condition? Do they? <coughs> Not really. They don't recognize a lot of these conditions, and they basically—it's sort of their—it's it's their their bane of their existence, just like fibromyalgia, the rheumatologist, and what we consider maybe non-allergic rhinitis is the bane of our existence. Although I kind of like treating that disorder. Okay, so. Uh, I think it's an open area of uh, interest and so forth. So we, everyone's got their chronic uh, conditions that have that are poorly ill-defined, and uh, so they don't really. Uh, and I do get referrals though, because some of the local ones know that I have interest in these areas, and or somehow they find me. I don't know. 
Um, but, uh, but it's not like they're breaking down the doors, you know, but I think there's more people out there with this problem than it needs to be assessed. So you've just done open label immunotherapy on these women? Yeah, I did, I, I did. I tried applying for some, you know, industry sponsored grants, but there's no intellectual property here. So it's not really a large interest and it's, there's not a lot of clinical funding for trials these days uh, that don't have uh, significant, you know, funding, I mean, intellectual property opportunities and so forth. So um, it would be a nice collaboration to do a, 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 a good trial here. I think you would be, uh, uh, it, it's an under, it's a woman's health issue that needs to be further evaluated. So I'm open if anyone wants to collaborate. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I want to turn to something where I've actually done more work in, and that's seminal plasma hypersensitivity. And again, this has been around this, these cases are reported actually the year I was born. Uh, so I don't know if that was Providence. And uh, since this new initial case, uh, case uh, uh, that was reported, uh, numerous cases have been uh, subsequently identified. Uh, and we kind of break them down for lack of better uh, purposes into systemic and localized. And the syst uh, systemic, they have symptoms of what you'd expect with anaphylaxis, uh, hives, facial swelling, and angioedema, wheezing, respiratory problems, GI symptoms. And those severe extreme situations, as in the case I described, vascular collapse, you know, uh, passing out, um, and so forth. Now, the localized ones, which actually I see a lot more of, are these immediate uh, post-coital vulvovaginal burning and pain uh, types of cases, which can persist for hours and days. So we uh, call this localized. And um, the, uh, it's a diagnosis by exclusion. Uh, the symptoms should be alleviated with the use of a condom. Uh, many times I have patients tell me they don't have relief with use of a condom, but they don't dot, the male doesn't don the condom until after they've already initiated intercourse and there can be leakage, so it needs to be donned before initiating uh, intercourse. You certainly want to use, make sure they're not developing a latex sensitivity if they're using a latex-based condom, so that has to be excluded as well. You can demonstrate a positive prick skin test, the whole seminal fluid. However, I, I'll, as I talk about, that's not always the case, and I'll show a little example of that in a, in a moment. You can all, it should correlate with specific Ig responses to relevant seminal plasma proteins serologically. Uh, the prevalence is unknown. I estimated it by 20 to 40,000 uh, women with this condition, and it was based really on extrapolation from a television show that uh, years ago my father Leonard Bernstein did with Phil Donahue, and it, uh, it, it, there, at that time you can go online, you can find how many viewers there were. There were 446,000 viewers watching that show, and they received uh, over a 1,000 letters, um, and these people were sent out, um, uh, uh, they were sent out a questionnaire uh, querying their, you know, whether, you know, whether or not we thought, you know, they had probable or possible seminal plasma hypersensitivity. Uh, the um, responses, actually, this, the total responses we got were actually 0.24, uh, 20, uh, it's actually should be 24% response in the questionnaires. Uh, and basically it was from that we found that 130, uh, 130 uh, actually it is 0.24%, I apologize. 130 of these respondents had probable seminal plasma uh, hypersensitivity based on complete resolution of symptoms. So if I extrapolate that to 100 million sexually active women in the United States, came up with a figure of 29,000. So that's as good as we've got. It's not very good, uh, but it gives us a ballpark figure, at least for this one cross-sectional uh, assessment. But I think it's more common than people realize. Uh, and and I, this is, uh, I get emails every day uh, for people asking questions about uh, seminal plasma. You know, do they have this problem? And I know that you've had some cases here as well. So it's not as uncommon as people think. Uh, the, this was a study we did back in 1997 comparing uh, characteristics of localized versus systemic, and you can see the ages were similar. Uh, there really wasn't much difference, except that interestingly, we saw that uh, there was a much greater onset with first-time intercourse in localized reactors compared to systemics, and they, there was some signal of a possible food allergy increasing in the systemics compared to the localized. But, uh, it, that, they, they otherwise, they had very similar uh, characteristics. We did an updated analysis uh, with a larger population uh, that was published last year, 
And again, uh, we saw in this situation, systemic reactors were a little older. Uh, the duration of symptoms were a little uh, longer and the systemic, I think probably not understanding what was causing this. Uh, and we, we saw that the uh, systemics actually were uh, approached have been more atopic, but it didn't, it didn't uh, reach statistical significance. There was a small population that reported increased incidence of dog sensitization. I'll speak to that in a moment. Uh, but otherwise, there were not any other statistical differences. We didn't find the, um, they didn't think correlate with the findings that we found in our previous study in terms of food allergy and so forth. Um, so again, we don't really have any distinguishing clinical characteristics that predict uh, these uh, differences between the localized and systemics. If you look at the types of reactions that people have, systemics and localized, there's overlap that they Systemics can also have localized symptoms, uh, deep pain, burning, redness, rash, and blisters, but certainly um, we see this more in the localized reactors. And then the systemic reactor's most common problem is generalized itching, but uh, a, a subset get hives and respiratory problems as well. So uh, the, uh, it's been shown uh, previously that there are several Ig binding bands uh, that might be uh, important in seminal plasma and this uh, was reported uh, by uh, Weidinger's group uh, that uh, PSA uh, was thought to be a major uh, allergen in these individuals, and this is a, a glycoprotein, 32 kilodaltons, and uh, again, uh, it, patients, Ig binds to the deglycosylated uh, sem uh, seminal plasma proteins, indicating that the carbohydrate moiety is less important for allergenicity. We demonstrated that. Uh, in our lab that, that we haven't reported it yet. Um, so this is just showing uh, not only is PSA important, and this is basically uh, SDS page and immunoglots, and this is, uh, this, this is uh, a, a, a normal control, and these are four patients with seminal plasma. In this case, we can show uh, a, a band that corresponds with the molecular weight for PSA, but we have several of these bands down here that are 10 kilodaltons. And one thing about PSA, it's a protease, a serine protease, so it auto-digests. And so you get these uh, fragments of PSA uh, that uh, show up. And we've demonstrated that by mass spec, uh, mounting mass spec. You can see the peptides in it from prostate-specific antigen. Uh, so it's not just the 32 kilodalton, but also these fragments. And this can be challenging in, in studying these, uh, this condition because of the stability. We have to use... Uh, in vitro, we have to use protease inhibitors to try to maintain these, the stability of these, uh, these uh, proteins. Now, what's interesting is that uh, cross react the 30 to the 30 40 percent of women report symptoms after first exposure to seminal fluid. So, this suggests there may be some cross reactive presensitizing allergens. There was a report published in Jackie a few years ago that showed that there was cross reactivity with dog dander proteins in PSA speculating that this could be, uh, women uh, may have some exposure uh, to uh, these proteins. And, uh, and if you look at this from a dendogram, uh, you can see evolutionary that dog PSA and human PSA are very similar, similarly linked. Uh, there's a lot of number of different allergens that are following along this, uh, or enzymes, but these are very highly associated uh, uh, enzymes, proteins. So. In our studies, we haven't found that re relationship. I did show there was a slight increase in dog sensitivity in, the, uh, in, the, in that study I showed you earlier, but the numbers were very small, and most of our patients don't have dogs and aren't sensitized, so we're not convinced that that's the cause for this, uh, uh, for this onset after first-time intercourse at the present time. Now, I just want to show you that there are immunologic differences between systemic and localized. This is showing that systemics have higher specific IgE responses compared to localized. We can demonstrate IgE inhibit. We can get a, a specific inhibition showing selectivity uh, or specificity to these uh, proteins in the systemics, but not in the localized. Uh, and we see, uh, we also can show that in the systemics we have, this is beta hexaminidase mediated release assay using rat basophil leukemic cells. They have much greater release compared to the localized reactors, the systemics. This is total release, and these are normals. So again, the antibodies are much more functional and relevant in the systemics. We're not clear if really the localized are truly Ig mediated in, in their response. Similarly, when we do flow cytometry looking at 
uh, Th1, Th2 cytokines before and after desensitization, we can see shifts and increases in um, the, um, where's my here? This is showing uh, the uh, beginning. This is before uh, uh, the desensitization. After desensitization, we see uh, that, uh, and, and, this, and this is before and this is after. So here, this is a person with systemic. This is a person with localized. You can see that uh, the uh, in interferon gamma, you see a, a before. Here is inter this is the interferon gamma. This is after. It, so it goes up. And then IL-4, you can see before. And then you can see it actually goes down. Uh, after desensitization, we see no changes in the localized. So we can measure these responses. So we summarize the differences. These patients have systemic symptoms with systemic seminal plasma. The localized have vaginal pain, burning, swelling, and localized pruritus. They both re re are improved with use of a condom. Skin prick testing is positive, in, and, and so is serologic-specific IG to seminal plasma proteins and systemics, but equivocal sometimes and localized. We can't always elicit good responses. So that, in my mind, doesn't exclude that these people are not potential candidates for treatment post possibly. We can't demonstrate basal histamine release in the localized. We don't see a shift in Th2, Th1 responses. And the therapeutic response, interestingly, we get therapeutic responses in both of these cases. Although they're localized, they, the response is sometimes delayed and often incomplete, but it's much better than when they started out as baseline. And they're both able to conceive. Preg uh, fertility is not an issue. So our treatment recommendations, obviously, until they can actually get assessed and evaluated, is avoidance. We try using antihistamines, other, other medications, which is often ineffective. There's now a number of cases showing that graded intravaginal challenge using whole seminal plasma may be effective. And it's certainly a reasonable first approach because it's less time consuming, less expensive, and easy to administer. However, the gold standard has been subcutaneous desensitization using relative seminal plasma proteins, which has been shown to be effective to systemic and localized. But I much favor the graded intravaginal challenge because this is a lot of work to do that process to fractionate and to isolate these proteins. Um, the reason we actually did this process, because early on, uh, there's been some studies showing that high molecular weight seminal plasma factors can suppress cell-mediated immune responses. And actually, Svi Marcus, who uh, was working in our lab many, many years ago, was working on fertility issues, uh, uh, but found that several fractionated seminal plasma proteins exhibited immunosuppressive properties. And so we basically extrapolated that to have relevance in our observation early on when we didn't see responses <laughs> to great vaginal challenges. And that's why we started fractionating. But uh, Again, that may not be entirely clear. This is just an algorithm that's been, I, I published in a, a, a journal, and it just basically goes through this whole process of testing and trying some of these other problems first because they're first do no harm and easy for the al clinical allergist to do. Uh, if it's effective, obviously, they can continue that. If it's not uh, intravaginal graded challenge, if it's effective, great. They should maintain unprotected intercourse. If it's not effective, then we should think about other approaches uh, such as the uh, fractionation and subcutaneous desensitization. I want to just, I know I'm running a little bit late, but I'm just going to talk about a couple of things real quick and conclude. Uh, the Gulf War, uh, in 19, uh, in, after the first uh, tour in, uh, in the Iraq War, uh, these veterans came back and they started complaining of burning pain after ejaculation. And some of these co cases caused lo localized vaginal burning pain in their sexual partners. So we were funded by the Department of Defense to investigate this problem. And we distributed questionnaire surveys to 188 Gulf War veterans with suspected what we was called burning semen syndrome. And 7% had pre-existing symptoms, so we kind of excluded them. But less than 50% of their sexual partners had resolution, uh, and also less than 50% had resolution of symptoms after use of a condom. So we were able to exclude seminal plasma hypersensitivity. But when, in, in this analysis, we were able to divide these respondents into healthy and unhealthy. And we found, based on the absence of these, uh, uh, or presence of multiple physical symptoms, we found a significant correlation between the unhealthy group and post-traumatic stress disorder, but, and it wasn't really clear. It was very difficult to assess those individuals. But we did find five couples in the healthy group that met the criteria for seminal plasma hypersensitivity, and they actually were treated, and three of them responded completely, and one partially, one did not respond. This, this study, though, is, was a nice example of how not to do research, because it was basically, this was at the time when GPS was being developed. We didn't know where these guys, they went in, we don't know where they were when they were there, and then they came out. And there was no way of 
knowing what their exposures were and what potential problems were occurring. There was no records of their health problems before going in to any extent. Nothing was electronic. Everything was paper uh, at that time. Uh, it's amazing how electronic medical records have taken off in that, in that short period of time. Uh, but again, the, 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 there was a poor case definition of the underlying problem. There were multiple concomitant uh, somatic psychological symptoms hindering a focused evaluation. There were logistic difficulties because they were spread out all over the country, actually in England and uh, Alaska, all over the place. And it was hard to actually evaluate these people. They also had never had any rudimentary things excluded, such as sexually transmitted diseases. We had to actually lobby to have that done, and we also had to lobby to get the females evaluated, because you had to deal not just with the males, but also the females. So it was a, it was a lot of aggravation. Uh, but that being said, although we didn't identify the pathogenesis, it was, a, it was plausible that external environmental insults disrupted the innate immune responses in the male seminal fluid, which interfered with protective vaginal immune responses in the female genital tract, leading to a TH hypersensitive response in some of these individuals. But that, and, and we haven't really seen this, uh, this syndrome, but we have now seen something else called post-orgasmic illness syndrome, which has emerged and it's actually been out there for quite a while. In 2002, uh, men began reporting severe fatigue, low-grade fevers, flu-like symptoms, uh, concentration difficulties, and it occurred after ejaculation. Uh, uh, this uh, Waldinger from the Netherlands put together this criteria of, of their diagnosis. You can see here that it's a relatively protracted uh, problem, uh, lasting up to two to seven days. Uh, and there's spontaneous resolution. Again, in some cases, niacin has seemed to help, but, uh, and, and, and in two cases, Waldinger desensitized them to their own semen, which was very unclear whether they were doing whole seminal, whether they were doing seminal fluid or spermatozoa. It was just totally unclear what was being done there. Right now, it's an idiopathic disorder that uh, requires more investigation, and there is initiatives to actually uh, study this condition further. Um, yeah, so let's go back to our case and conclude here. So the patient and husband were provided serum and, uh, and the husband uh, provided fresh pulled ejaculate which collected over five days. We did prick testing the whole seminal fluid which was confirmed. He had, uh, although uh, serologically, as you'll see, we didn't really see robust specific Ig to whole seminal fluid in our ELISA assay. The, she was negative skin prick tested dog and dust mite and, and so forth. We do that just because of the, what was been published previously. Interestingly, because of her remote history of asthma, we did check an ENO and an FEV1. The FEV1 was normal, but her ENO was 118 parts per billion. So anytime you're gonna do something like this, even you know, with, especially someone who's got systemic symptoms and you're gonna desensitize them to something that potentially can make them worse, you really should make sure they have stable asthma. And I think we recognize that the worst outcomes with conventional immunotherapy is undiagnosed, untreated, poorly controlled asthma. So she was started on beclomethasone at that time, uh, two puffs twice a day, and uh, the um, she we this is just showing her her specific Ig to whole seminal fluid. And you can see this is normal controls, which we had, you know, uh, and, and this is the patient, so it was slightly increased, but not compared to our positive controls. Uh, and I think, uh, and when you fractionate, we basically run it through a column and we take out these different fractionated peaks based on molecular weight, and we can then, this is, you know, again, frac this is just basically SDS page of whole seminal fluid, but these are looking at immunoblots using these different fractions, and in this case, you can see that she elicited specific IgE to PSA bands, the bands that correspond with PSA in this fraction. These actually, we know, are the molecular weights for lactoferrin and seminogelin, and I'm you know, we have to do a little bit more work in this area, but we believe that these also are potentially specific IgE uh, uh, eliciting uh, proteins in seminal fluid. We saw her back for treatments. Her ENO had come down. She was doing better. Uh, and so we tested both of them, the seminal plasma fractions. They, she elicited positive reactions to the fractions that we would suspect. She underwent rapid subcutaneous desensitization to all three fractions over approximately um, uh, uh, four hours. I, uh, we did collect blood uh, to assess immunologic changes post-treatment and then skin tested her post-treatment as well to see if there were threshold changes. And we did an intravaginal challenge to her husband's fresh ejaculate in the office to see if she had reactions. These are just her arms after the series of injections, uh, large locals. And we can see that post-treatment, uh, her skin test did decrease by the prick test to fraction 2A. 
it was it was much uh, smaller, and we saw a log one log dilution difference in the fraction two B, no change in the fraction three. So there was some evidence of um, desensitization. They had natural unprotected intercourse, and we again got some additional blood to assess post treatment. Uh, this is showing how the and uh, these time points her. The CD4 cells producing DM interferon were increasing, and her IL-4s were actually going down. And you can see these responses quite quickly in these types of models, and this has been shown in other uh, systems as well. So again, showing that there was some immunologic response. And this is the outcome. She showed, sent me this. They were able to conceive because they could have complete unprotected uh, intercourse, and uh, so it was very successful. We've reported subsequently that there is no issue with localized or systemic semoplasma's ability to conceive. A lot of it has to do with their ability to have an unprotected intercourse and in normal interpersonal relationships. Um, and again, there are uh, case series showing that you know, people can uh, conceive other ways as well through in vitro fertilization or intrauterine insemination using wash spermatozoa. So with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, what we've gained from this is to know that this is something that is within our realm of expertise as allergist immunologists. And, and we need to be aware of this when we uh, are seeing patients or patients come to us with these unexplained conditions that we really have, don't, that that's outside of our comfort zone. And I'm always there for questions. Uh, you can always email me and I'll help you uh, with these cases. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> any, yeah, any questions? Yes. Um, I went to the college meeting in November and there was a poster there from uh, the University of Virginia and they had reported a case of a woman who was allergic to dog and skin tested positive and was also having reaction after intercourse with her husband. Right. And so that was pretty interesting. And you know, a lot of women have dog allergy. Yeah, but again, but you know, the main, we, we there's this. a lot to be said. It's a, it's a, it's a, there's, a, there's a problem there because, you know, they're what are they testing them to? They're testing to like epidermal allergies, really, you know, can they one or whatever the allergen is. And what is, the, what's been shown is the homology is between PSA and uh, dog and human and so forth. So, you know, it, it's a little bit more complex than that. And I don't think we can make a case that this is what's causing, uh, you know, uh, these reactions. There, you know, in the, in the systemics, I think it's a traditional classic. I mean, there may be some decreases uh, in the normal protective, innate, and adapt, uh, innate responses that's affecting their adaptive immune responses in one way, and they become sensitized. And in this case, this woman had immediately after pregnancy, um, but, you know, we don't still understand what's the inciting event, but we don't understand what induces sensitization to common allergens other than genetic susceptibility and experimental exposure for that, for the most part. Um, in the localized one, we think it's probably not so, even though these patients respond, our area we're looking at right now are other mechanisms for reasons why it's, it's, these women respond to treatment. I don't think it's because of uh, a TH1, TH, a TH2 to a TH1 shift or, or blocking antibodies like we see with you know, systemics. And, and, I, and I don't think we can make a case yet for animals uh, being responsible for, for symptoms after first time intercourse. Recognize women actually in very, very low concentrations to actually make PSA. So you can measure PSA in, in, in women, at, but at much logs, lower levels, and so forth. So, so it, it's a little bit more complex than just saying it's the dog. Jonathan, one of our outside audience, uh, Bill Anderson, typed in, you could comment on local delayed reactions that are not IgE-mediated. What, what's known about that? Anything? Well, we, we're in the process of putting together some work, and this is an area where it's not published yet, but we're looking at other mechanisms that deal with the epithelial cell barriers and so forth uh, in terms of what's affecting them. And, and so I don't, I'm not really, I, don't, I can't really speak to the results yet because we're, we've got some, we have some data, but we think that, that there are certain uh, receptors that are important that, that actually can be down-modulated on, uh, uh, in these systems and, and it might be related to, uh, you know, it, 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 if they're not well controlled, they can have imp impaired uh, uh, barrier cell uh, 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 ex you know, uh, disruption and ex exposure to these uh, proteins and, uh, and their activation of uh, other 
receptors that cause neurogenic pain. So, so we think it's a neurogenic pathway, essentially. And uh, so we are looking at, you know, we have, that, we have an in vitro cell system looking at vaginal epithelial cells, and, and we're looking at, uh, we have some hypotheses that we're trying to work through right now. But it's most likely disruption of the <coughs> epithelium uh, and in the right, you know, again, there's a lot of variables that can affect that, uh, and that it's stimulating these, possibly through nociceptive uh, C fibers that's causing the pain, the localized pain. And you can actually downregulate these with continuous exposure. You can desensitize these different receptors, uh, and so, and that's been demonstrated in other models and so forth. So. That's one of the areas that we think is the mechanism in this case. So, so you're seeing the result, but you're not seeing it because it's an necessarily an immunologic response. How did you pick your concentrations when you did desensitization? And how did you prepare those for subcutaneous desensitization? Well, we go through it's a pretty laborious process because when we, uh, we certainly uh, fractionate them, we have to uh, you know, do protein content measurements. We have to uh, you know, culture them to make sure there's no viral or any other kinds of infectious process going on. We then, you know, we, uh, you know, nearly four filter as well. And uh, basically, uh, we do a, we try to do a, uh, at least a three log. I, it's, it's sort of arbitrary, but, you know, because, you know, these patients with systemics typically have uh, positive prick skin tests. So you know, we at least go at least three logs back, three, but we start off typically at one to 100,000. Uh, some cases with their history, if they're really compelling, I might start off to a one to a million. This woman we started off, uh, I think it was 100, one to 100,000, and uh, you know, and make log dilutions, you know, uh, one, you know, tenfold dilutions and so forth. So, uh, but it's based on protein content and how much we're delivering, and you know, we try to give at least 60 micrograms based on what's been done in other rapid desensitization molecules, try to, uh, models try to get up to at least maybe 100 micrograms and so forth. And did you have to go through your IRB at your institution to do you know, it? Interestingly, early on when this was considered research we did, but when we tried to submit an IRB and informed consent for that before, they said this is standard treatment now because it's published and they didn't require a IRB. We did get IRB consent for blood work subsequently, which I have a universal IRB consent that lets me draw blood for investigating a number of different uh, allergic disorders. Uh, so it's sort of a generic template. So, uh, but we didn't have to do it for treatment because these, we still have patients sign in a consent, but it's not a university IRB consent any longer. They went, they didn't think it was necessary for us to have uh, an ongoing consent since it's been shown and proven to be effective. This is kind of random. I was thinking about the spermatozoa autoantibodies, and uh, you said it was the gamma delta T cells that were predominant there. I mean, those response to atypical antigens in general. I was wondering, is there something antigenically unique about spermatozoa in terms of like nucleic acids or, or even flagella proteins that make them hit the radar there somehow? It's hard to know. Um, you know, I think most of those models are related to, you know, external stimuli that's causing disruption, and whether it's infection or, you know, something, you know, that's activating this process. Maybe heat shock proteins are, you know, involved as a result of these inflammatory stimuli, but we don't really know. I mean, obviously, normally it shouldn't. There shouldn't be any uh, any issues. I mean in terms of you know, normal fertility issues and so forth. But again, there's a lot of other things that bathe in the seminal fluid that bathe these spermatozoa that they can be out of whack and so forth. And you know, we haven't done large population studies to, to look at, I mean, there are studies out there looking at estimated concentrations of all these different enzymes and all these other factors in seminal fluid, but we haven't looked at it in terms of these, uh, I haven't looked at it with respect to autoantibodies, and I certainly haven't. But we don't think that this is an autoimmune problem in, in these women. We, we Early on, we did look at autoantibodies and spermatozoa autoantibodies. And again, we don't do anything now with, uh, we're not, this is not involving the sperm at all. We're just looking at this, the seminal fluid. The sperm, we, we uh, discard. So <laughs> this, is all, this is all related to proteins in the uh, seminal fluid. So even though I'm showing the sperm, uh, it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> but again, uh, in terms of 
immuno immunologic reproductivity, I think that it's certainly possible. And we're being taught that the uh, parts of the reproductive factor sort of immunologically protect, and those orning polis fluids themselves are part of that protected they area. Are. I do wonder if, you know, we're actually protecting against yourself from those things that are actually being, you know, protected outwards. So I wonder if maybe somehow it's a protective mechanism for the, you know, the sperm producer. Right. Exactly. There's something, something's going awry. And these are difficult problems to assess because we don't have good animal models. If you're going to do an animal model, the best model would be a rabbit because they have the closest genitalia to humans. Uh, you mice don't really aren't good models for this or... Or rats, but uh, so it is a um, difficult to study because you're dealing with two variables. You got the woman and the male. Is it a problem in the male? A problem in the female? A problem in both? And you have to study all these different factors, and it's uh, it, 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 it's it's a little challenging in that respect when you start thinking about good study designs to unravel these some of these questions. John, and I was always taught that women should have this because they really have an immunologic disease. With intercourse with any man, and, I, and I've had a couple of cases where that was not historically the case, and it seemed that ultimately it was an emotional, psychological problem when they reported it, it symptoms only with one male partner. Is that do you see people with that? Situation? I've seen it both ways. Where it's, it's you know, interestingly, when you look at our populations uh, reports. Uh, these women tend not to be very promiscuous. They, on average, like 1.4 sexual partners, under two partners. So there's not a lot of experience. A lot of these, as I mentioned, 40% after first time contacts, they never had intercourse before. So, uh, so it's, so it's sometimes hard to answer that question. But I've seen women who reported with other sexual partners. I've seen it where they've never had trouble with other partners uh, before. But many of them are first time exposures. So, uh, but. So I can't really fully address that, but I do think it's it's not one or the other per se. So, is it unique to the genital tract, like oral sex? They don't have that problem. Don't see it with oral. Don't see it with interestingly, and I think that's other obviously of other mucosal, uh, you know, protective immune responses there. That, is that you know, oral, you know, oral? that that's the least sensitizing group, right? Oral immunotherapy then may not work anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem to. I'm not sure that would be well received. Uh, I have to be a very sensitive you know, issue. Very different. <laughs> but, you know, these are really devastating problems for these, these couples. You know, I've had one couple who actually ended up getting divorced, actually from Alaska, because, you know, they really didn't have any. Uh, um, I, I, I think she had other problems going on. She had recurrent vulvo vaginal yeast infections as well. and. Uh, but you know it's uh, but it, it can be quite uh, problematic. If uh, so, we, when they treat these people, they're quite gratified. They're, it's a gratifying experience. It really does help help preserve relationships. And for for initial workup, is there uh, ELISA or or you know, cap, uh, There or is at uh, available. Or there is the at test. Test. yeah. IBT has a, a, a test, but I'm not. I never could really figure out what antigens they're using and so forth. I am willing to have people send samples if they're good cases, and I will run it in my lab. Uh, we have a pretty well optimized assay now with good controls, positive and negative controls, and uh, and at, and we do this at no charge at this point because we're really just interested in trying to you know help in that respect. So not always the turnaround is not always like two days, but you know we we will work with people remotely to try to help them in that situation. Uh, now, in this case, one of the things we showed is the reason why I don't think she had such a robust response uh, to her. Uh, sometimes, you know, there's a dilutional effect in seminal, whole seminal fluid, so you may not see there. We saw much greater responses to the fractions uh, than we did to the actual whole seminal fluid. So, um, so that, that could be a reason, you know, why you may see some equivocal or false or, or lower responses than you would expect. Um, but what I'm seeing now mostly are localized for some reason, and uh, even though we do see, you know, systemics, uh, it just seems that, uh, and these, these tests, I'm, and I don't think that specific IG, even though we'll measure it, I don't think that's really the marker that we have to be looking for. I think that probably the fact that it goes away with the use of a condom is very important, but we still need to understand more about the pathogenesis of that. Jonathan, one of the cases I sent to you, which I think turned out to be true immunologic, the woman thought that it was a diet of her sex partner and food proteins transferred. 
Is there any validity to that? We didn't there is. I mentioned that the differential diagnosis uh, this, uh, early on in there, you can transfer drugs, you can transfer food. So if a woman's allergic to peanut and the guy loves eating Reese's cups or whatever, and you know it's possible, you know, if, uh, if to have some systemic reactions or uh, I mean, you know, through the body fluids, through seminal fluid, it's been reported for chemotherapies through other drugs where it's been transmitted through body fluids and so forth, where you can get localized or systemic reactions. So it is something that you want to exclude. We haven't found that to be the case, though, in any of our patients and so forth so far. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, a unifying, uh, but it's in the differential, and you need to look at that. Yes. How do you decide which women get desensitized to candida for the people with recurrent Kindle? Symptoms. Well, we like to demonstrate a specific response, Ig response, and uh, honestly. Um, so, do you use a I, vaginal challenge to use to determine who is the candidate for desensitization? No, we skin test them to the Candida albicans commercial. So, extract. strictly done on skin testing. Skin testing, and uh, we did do some serologic <laughs> testing before. We um, we don't do any provocation. We like to demonstrate that there's culture proven Candida that they have to have positive Canada, and they have to have, you know, obviously the recurrence of this in, in, in the absence of diabetes, oral contraceptives, and the recurrent use of antibiotics, uh, and having had, you know, responded to antifungals, but it recurs, and, and they can't get off the antifungals and so forth. So, um, so that's the kind of criteria we use. That being said, as I said, it's not a, um, it, it's not the type of specific Ig responses that we use in terms of our, our criteria for aeroallergens uh, with prick skin test being most specific and then not going beyond the concentration of one to a thousand because of the concern of irritant responses at higher concentration. So um, I had one case and I'm not proud of this but it was it was my desire to help the patients who came in and she really had an equivocal skin test response and I said we can try desensitization and I saw her back in follow-up and lo and behold her symptoms have gone away so it's hocus pocus right now I don't she met all the other criteria that's why we need to do more work in this area but I, you know she actually got better so I think that there are other responses that occur that are non IgE that can down regulate immunomodulate these responses I mean you can desensitize different types of receptors by continuous exposure and, and that's, you know, it's unclear, you know, what else might be doing it. Maybe she's having, uh, you know, there's other factors uh, that are ha having an impact, you know, on prostaglandins on, you know, that, that have been shown to be related here or something. I don't know what the mechanism is. And do you think women with their mucocutaneous candidiasis may be candidates for this procedure? This is a different problem entirely different than what this is. I mean, these women have, you know, they're, they've got, you know, those, these patients have, you know, candidiasis in their nails, everywhere else they have immune, it's more, I mean, I think that, you know, where early on the best treatments there were those transfer factors, but which were stopped because of the risk probably of transmitting infection because that was pre-1981 when they used to do transfer factor, but uh, it, it's, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, given the complexity of that condition, I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend uh, exposing them subcutaneously to Canada. Uh, it's a, that's a, that appears to be a totally different immune immunologic disorder. We have a couple cases like that, you know, and uh, I haven't really been bold enough to do that presently. We're trying to make some transfer factor for them, but that's very difficult too these days. It's not a hard procedure, it's just you gotta get through the IRB and everything else. It's kind of a, a lot of work for a single case. But. Thank you. Thanks very much.